Welcome to the International Teacher Podcast with your host, Greg, the single guy, and Matt, the family guy. We're recording episodes from around the globe to tell you about the best kept secret in education. That's right, it's teaching overseas. We're glad to have you. This episode, I am Greg, and I am interviewing my co-host so you can get to know him a little bit better here. And he's been overseas for at least, I want to say he's been overseas for five years in Venezuela, and he's been here almost eight years in the Middle East. So I'd like to introduce Matt, the family guy, to our show. Actually, if we could just put a, 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 a surname on that, and we'll, we'll go with expat Matt, the family guy. All right. From now on, <laughs> you're expat Matt, the family guy. There we go. So, Trademark, <laughs> Incorporated. Well, it's good to have you on on the show here, Matt. I know we were on the show last time, but this fo- this show is this episode is focusing on you and how you've become the podcaster and where why should people listen to you when they want to learn about overseas? You know, so that's a lot of pressure, Greg. I'll I try know to do it is, best. but you said you go off the cuff. Mm-hmm. There's no format to this show. This is just straight up Matt. Matt, the family guy, expat Matt. That's right. This is just us talking. It's us like, talking. Let's yeah, do this. I like the I us talking. Wait. Exactly. You know, what I want to know is, Matt, how did you really hear about, like, you were teaching in Minnesota, right? Yeah, I had been. Do you want me to just walk you through this story of how this all kind of well, came about? Well, not really. I mean, I can ask you a few pointer questions. Like, I can say, like, sure. you're you're married. You're married. You and, you and Stacy have been married, and you got married in Minnesota. You were both teachers. Right. So what brought you overseas at all? I mean, how did you know about overseas teaching? The only reason I knew about overseas teaching was because at the time, Stacy was my girlfriend and she had done her student teaching in Costa Rica. And so we were talking. I remember we were talking in the kitchen one night after a particularly awful day of teaching. And this is when I was teaching fourth grade in Minnesota, Woodbury, Minnesota. For those of you, if you're in the wood hood and you're listening, what up? <laughs> <laughs> Special shout out to Royal Oaks Elementary. Anyway, um, so I had had just an awful day. I think this was maybe a day or two after conferences. Conferences were a disaster. It just was not looking good. And um, I had been headed down this road for a while. I was burned out. Um, this was at the time of no student left untested. And this is when Minnesota was starting to dabble in merit-based pay. So not only was testing and assessment an issue, but uh, merit-based pay was also, I was burned out, I was fried, and I was ready to quit. And I was starting to talk about how I would transition out of my education and career, or uh, my career in education. And she stopped me and said, well, wait, what do you think about teaching overseas? And I was like, would never even cross my mind. Like I knew she had done it, but you're talking to a guy who'd never even been to Florida before. I mean, I've been to Mexico, from what I recall, a couple of times. That's a whole nother story. But uh, yeah, so she suggested rather than quitting education that we take a look at going overseas. And that's where the story starts. So she didn't even say like, let's go to Florida and teach or let's go to California. I mean, she just said she just blurted out, let's go look at overseas. Well, she said before you. Yeah, she'd been in Costa Rica and had a great time, but she had originally, she said, well, before you quit, you know, you've invested so much in becoming an educator. Like, you know, I had my master's degree at that point and, you know, so had had invested so much time and with coaching and everything too. I mean, I'd coached three seasons for not going on nine years at that point, but I just was done. I was fried. And she said, well, before you quit, what do you think of this? And it was like, yeah, okay, let's look into it. And that's where it started on that path. And this, again, this was mid-November 2008. Wow. That was a long time ago. All right. So sure what did was. you say? You said, all right. And what did you guys start doing then? Like, So we look started at looking at, sure. No, no, not that. She started looking, basically we started just Googling. Was Google even around at that time? I don't. This might have been even pre-Google. This banging? Were we banging on? I don't even know. Anyway, we uh, just started looking up international schools. We didn't. I didn't know anything about it. She certainly knew more than I did. And um, 
then we started looking at job, like how do you get a job at an international school? And she had still been friends with somebody who was teaching overseas and she wrote them and asked for a suggestion. And they suggested we look at the University of Northern Iowa job fair, which is held and the last, which is typically held Super Bowl weekend. So I happen to know there's a lot of international educators that have spent time at the Brown Bottle uh, eating and then watching the Super Bowl or hanging out at the one hotel in do you, Greg, do you remember which city Cedar is it? Cedar Falls, Cedar Rapids. It's it's Cedar Rapids. It's outside of Cedar Rapids. Well, Waterloo is the yeah yeah yeah. And if you haven't been to Waterloo in you know late January, early February, oh, you haven't missed lived. out so much. Yeah, I mean the, yeah, the I mean, endless cornfields of just of <laughs> snow and wind. It's like the planet. Yeah. Hoth. <laughs> <laughs> of all the places to hold an international, I mean, you have people that come in from all over the world too. I think Welcome you can get a tauntaun in the. In, Iowa. I think you can get a tauntaun to go in between Waterloo and Cedar Rapids. I think actually, it's like Hoth. It really is. Yeah, you pretty much. You, that's pretty much it. They like they only rent minivans at the airport. That's <laughs> yeah. the kind of place we're <laughs> like Bob. That's the kind Bob. of place we're talking about yeah. here. Yeah, it's like holding. It's like how would we say this? It'd be like holding spring break at Salt Lake City, Utah. It just is not an ideal maybe destination for that, but. Hey, what the heck? And sorry, so, Salt so you ended Didn't up in you two ended up in Venezuela. The, were you married by then? You guys had gotten married before you left. Well, you're you're skipping out on a whole nother part of oh, the did story. I? Do you want me to? Go I'm in? sorry. Please go ahead with your story. So you're well, on the well, planet there, Hoth the, in Iowa. Well, do you think people want to know about the job fair stuff, or do you? Should I just glance through that? Well, I think we can do, that's up to you. I think we could do a whole episode on just job fairs. Like you said, this is not just an education thing. This is about sure. you. This is, maybe well, if you want to, you okay. can. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that because it gives people an idea of how we got from point A to point B. Yeah. And so in obviously November, I was ready to quit throwing the towel. I want to go work at Walmart or whatever. And so the job, we signed up for the job fair. <clears throat> that was the last weekend of January or, or early February, Super Bowl weekend. And we went to this job fair at the University of Northern Iowa. Um, and we, when you get there, basically there's administrators from all these different schools that have access to your files. And if they think you fit a profile of a teacher they want, they'll give you an interview form. And so you can get there ahead of time and you can see if you have any of these pre-interview requests. And so we got there and there were several schools that had uh, wanted to interview us. I think we had interviews for maybe Venezuela, China, Greece, Cyprus. I believe Cyprus is, sorry, I know I'm an international teacher. Cyprus is not a part of Greece, correct? I believe sorry. it's on its own. I believe it is. Okay, good. I th yeah, never been. So, so those, uh, these people from these schools are in Iowa too? Yes. Like, yeah, yeah. so you had yeah. yeah, you had the school administrators from these places all in Iowa. So anyway, we, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And then you also have a meeting period where before all the interviews start, you can go around and schmooze and, and you can, you know, kiss up to all the administrators that you hope to get jobs from, which by the way, they hate. So anyway, more on that later when we go to talk about job fairs. And I had basically two, two rules that there were two locations that I said I would not work in. Because when you sign up for the job fair, they give you information for all these schools and you read about the country and the schools. And you can guess Venezuela was one of the countries that I was like, I will not go work there because and Alabama read, was second, right? Alabama. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so and, Venezuela was one of them because of politics, right? Right. And, and so which was um, it would be the country that I presently live in now. So I gave my, my wife an ultimatum. There was two countries I would never go live in. So for those of you that say, never say never, I'm not going to work there. I've now worked and lived in two countries that I never said I would go to. And I haven't, for the most part, regretted it. 99% loved it. So there you go. Wow. Uh, so anyway, we uh, interviewed with a couple schools and we went up to our table and I'll just call him Mike, our, our, who was uh, the superintendent of that school. And I think I can say the new school name at this point, can sure I? Sure you can. We can talk about yeah, schools so after we've left. It was a school called CIPLIC, or Colegio Internacional Puerto La Cruz. Check out that Spanish. And so we went up there, 
my Spanish is still pretty good. Right. And um, I walked up to the table because you can decline the interviews also. And so I had checked the box that said, hey, you know, thank you, but no, thank you. Have a great day. And I walked to the table and Greg, I, I cannot explain this, but this voice in the back of my head said, just listen to what the guy has to say. And as I was reaching out to hand him the paper, I kind of stuck it back behind me and jammed it in my bag. I still have the paper, too. I've kept it. It's in a file at home. And I stuck it in there and um, started talking to this guy. And it was instantly like he was less of an administrator and just more like an uncle who had just gotten back from, you know, a 15 year vacation. And so we oddly enough got suckered into an interview with him and uh yeah, well, I can talk more about that a little bit later. So anyway, the interview went really well at the job fair, and that's how we got hired in Venezuela. So you guys picked up roots from home. You packed up everything, just the two of you, and moved on down to Venezuela and started teaching. One of the key points of us, at that point, we had discussed getting married. We weren't married yet, but obviously it was on the horizon. We'd been dating a few years at that point, so that wasn't a long stretch. And he said, well, you guys are planning on getting married, right? And we looked at each other. We're like, yeah, yeah, we're totally, totally getting married. <laughs> I can't and wait to hear her version of this story, Matt. We're going to interview her next. <laughs> no, you can. I'm pretty sure... Yeah, no, it wasn't like a pressure application or anything. I'm just joking. Other, I know you course. both yeah, are so good. That. Yeah. And so basically in between that time, um, you know, we didn't rush into this by any means, but then we got engaged the next month and then we were married in June. And then three weeks later, we were on a plane headed for Venny. And that was you and Stacy and your dog at the time and no kids. Our, uh, no kids, that right. thankfully. And the dog, Guzzi or Guzman, who was a chocolate Labrador retriever that weighed 115 pounds. And he'll he'll have some stories coming up later. So for people looking how they want to maybe travel with pets. Yeah, we'll definitely bring that, that up. Yeah, we that's some interesting ones. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, in uh, late July, we the funny part about this trip, I'd never been to Florida even. So we flew from Minneapolis into Miami and we spent, we had a four and a half hour layover in Miami. So Stacy's picture, pick, uh, sister picked us up. We went out, drove around, checked out the town. I was like, this place is amazing. I want to come back here. We went out to eat, you know, had a great time. And then they stuck us on a uh, flight and we flew into Caracas, Venezuela. And I think we arrived at midnight and, you know, it had been a long day of traveling. And uh, I think I had flown in a plane for seven hours and so for somebody who's not, who's never really, fl I'd flown four times prior to that. So. Yeah. I remember um, the first time I idea. met you, cause I came down a year later and we'll talk about that later too. But I know when I met you guys down there with you and I flew the first time together back in the States, <laughs> I remember you hated flying. You had a phobia. Oh. I mean, I think you were taking like a, you were taking a happy pill before you had to get on the, like a, a medication before you could even get I'm on the flight. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I would have registered as an opiate addict <laughs> prior to getting on just about every flight you would had taken with me up to that point. So, oh yeah, my Lord. Hey, for the for the record, though, that was a really bumpy flight, but I just couldn't get over how you just sat there and read your book. And I just spelled out our impending doom for the flight from <laughs> that was from Houston to Minneapolis. I still remember that. Yeah, at the time, I, I didn't even know you that well. I I was wondering why you had pulled out a rosary beads and and you know you had your Bible <laughs> verse that you were reading and and I was like, boy, you and I are candles lit. Yep, you and I are just yeah. two different oh. people, man. But uh, that, you've come a long way. Now it's like whatever yeah. you know. If the plane crashes, you might wake up. Um, <laughs> right now, you're well, just I'll such a good traveler. Be awake cause I'm I'm probably taking one of my kids to the bathroom. So of course I'd be awake at that point. So yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much how we ended up in Venezuela. And what's your next question? You, you got some good ones. Keep going. Well, I don't know. I, I, you had your first, your first child was, was he born in, um, you have four now, but the first one yeah. was born in Venezuela or is he born well, we, in the States? I have a, I have a saying that, uh, when we were in Venezuela, we said Nacio, or sorry, excuse me. Let me back up again. We say uh, hecho en socialismo, pero nació en los Estados Unidos. 
And so for those of you who don't have Lo Espanol, it basically means in Venezuela, they had this slogan they'd put on all the milk containers that made that said made in socialism, hecho en socialismo. So I always told people that my son was made in, in socialism, but he was born in the United States. And so the Venezuelans that heard that really got a kick out of that. They thought that was funny because anybody who's lived there knows as a part of the government agenda down there, which is a hugely socialist government, they have to remind people, remember, you're having this milk because the government made it for you, not because they stole the farm and from the farmer and then proceeded to ooh, nope. produce less milk. The government's providing it. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whole nother, that's a whole nother batch of stories to get into also. Well, I remember, um, so I always think of your son's first walk around my, like when he grew up a little bit more and he started walking, <laughs> I tell sure. everybody that he walked over to get a beer out of my beer cooler at my, at my apartment in my, around my swimming pool. And I don't when know you, if that's when even you true like, anymore, but now it is true to me. <laughs> when you say it like that, you sound like we're giving kids um, liquor and that wasn't the case at all. But yeah, he... He was getting there was a crowd me. of 12, 12 <laughs> people, 12 adults, and I'm literally the only person who saw him stand up and walk to the cooler and pull a beer out. And, you know, I was so, I mean, I was so excited that he had gotten up and walked to the cooler. I just totally overlooked the fact that here's my one, <laughs> you know, however old he was, sitting there holding a glass bottle. And for those of you who've only had one kid, you know what death that could eminently possess and so you would be all on that but now that i have four kids it's like hey he's got a glass bottle i'm just about in tears already were your other three first kids step. born in venezuela too or tell us move no, on no. a little so, bit we could talk for hours about so we're it we're gonna we'll skip we'll skip through a little bit uh so in venezuela at ciplc we ended up working for five years uh, I almost didn't make it through that first year, but I think we need maybe need to have an episode about what people should expect in their first <laughs> year, first few months, because I, I barely made it to October that year, and that was kind of tough. But anyway, after five years, uh, we decided enough was enough. Uh, you know, we'd seen things like the death of Hugo Chavez. We saw the illegitimate election of Maduro come in, and that was in April of 2013. And we had actually in, gone back to the University of Northern Iowa job fair in January of 2013 and interviewed with <clears throat> several more schools uh, ranging from China to India to the Middle East. And lucky enough, uh, we ended up getting jobs, securing jobs in the Middle East in country number two that I said I would never work in. And I also have to preface, when we went to Venezuela, we took a two-year sabbatical from our school district. So that was only a two-year plan. And but you stayed there five years. five years. Yeah, we stayed five years. So at that point, it was like, well, we're all in on this and, and let's go with it. And so we got hired in the Middle East. Um, we work for a uh, company. It's a really big company. And it's so big for the fact that they have their own school system for all the expat, expat employees, kids. And so do we have kids from, is it maybe 45 different countries, I believe? It's at very least. multinational, very diverse. It's a great place to be. And so um, through that job fair, we've been hired and uh, we came here in August 2013 and haven't looked back since. And we had one boy when we got here. And then in uh, September 2014, we had twin identical boys. There's a few stories for them. And uh, in, uh, let's see, March 2017, I guess we'll call him, we almost had to call him Jesus. <laughs> uh, came along and he was born in uh, March 2017. A lot of people would say, well, you have twins. I would think that'd make you more careful when you have kids. I said, listen, we were so careful. We almost named him Jesus. There you I almost go. changed my name to Joseph and Stacy almost changed her name to Mary. Because, uh, yeah, immaculate is probably the best way to describe that. Anyway, hey, how, how often do you guys go story. home? You've been overseas for so many years. How many? How, tell me a little bit about going back to uh, Minnesota or where you call home. Sure. Just, you know. Well, typically living in Veni was a real pain to get home. So, for example, you lived, if you could fly in a straight line from Venezuela to Minnesota, it'd take maybe six hours, maybe at that, because it's about three hours to Miami and Miami is about three hours to Minneapolis. Um, so the only problem is when you're flying from South America, particularly Venezuela, you're looking at a 20 to 36 hour trip to go in a straight line that would take you seven hours. So that that will get covered in the traveling as an expat episode. Um, so typically we would go home for 
uh, holidays and summers when we're in Venezuela. Here, when you're over in the Middle East, it takes a little bit longer to get back. So we would fly only during the, we went home our very first year for Christmas and we found out what jet lag is really like, especially with the kid. And we were like, never again, never again. Even if the world is burning, we're just staying. And so now we only go home in the summers. <clears throat> so we usually get out around mid June and we're uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin until mid uh, August. So we only go home once a year. Now flash forward to 2020 and then COVID strikes. And so we, because of various government shutdowns, not only Middle East, but also everywhere with the travel restrictions, I mean, there was millions of people that were affected by that. So we haven't been home since August, 2019. Wow. And so I was just having a conversation with my boys this morning and they said, daddy, when do we get to go home? Because we, you know, I guess I can talk a little bit about this too. We, we've tried to be very careful about establishing what home really is. So, for example, the kids obviously feel like the Middle East is part of their home. But also, um, we've also established, you know, Minnesota. And we technically, even though we're Minnesotans, we live in Wisconsin. We aren't Wisconsinites, but that's anyway, long story. But uh, we have a house in Wisconsin that we spend a lot of time at in the summer. And that is home to them as well. And when we're home, we try to do as many minnesota e things as we can for example like viking preseason games they want to go to twins games whatever uh the boys go to the university of minnesota golden gophers baseball camp university of minnesota duluth hockey camp ice hockey camp so these kids you know, fishing, bleed purple like that they bleed purple they, they work thankfully camouflage. yes yeah thankfully yes and so we've tried to instill a sense of this is home but also that is home as well because i've i've come across kids here and I'll say, hey, you know, they'll be from the U.S. Where are you from? And they're like, uh, I don't know. And so you ask one of my kids and they'll tell you I'm from Minnesota, but I live in Wisconsin. Yeah, we'll have to and have a so, whole episode just on third culture kids, right? Because they oh, don't yeah. really, once we travel around and, and those of us that have those people that have kids that travel around country to country and back home to the States or Canada, the kids grow up sure. not really knowing what that word home means. And it's a really good question. I, and I want to get some feedback from some other people, but it's interesting how it's interesting how your kids have always told me, you know, I love the way that your kids will mention, like, are we going to go home to the Maldives again, dad? You know, <laughs> like the Maldives, yeah, if you so don't know where that is listeners. It's, it's the East coast of Africa, just below India in the middle of the ocean. There's a, a set of islands that you will, you would absolutely love to go to. It's a long, far away from uh, the U S but for us, it's only about six hours away by flight and uh, a little bit longer trip, but six hour flight. And uh, his, you know, Matt, yeah. your kids call it home, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. That's a bucket list travel destination for millions of people. And it's a, you know, five hour, five minute flight for us, which is it's pretty off cool. Of our, it's and off our so bucket list. That's for sure. Tech, it's definitely off the bucket list. Um, we've been there five times and I'm not, I'm not trying to be braggadocious uh, or anything like that. That's not it. It's just, we went there one year on a whim. We found a good deal and we celebrated my twins first birthday in the Maldives. I and then we there, ended up yeah. finding a deal. Well, the next year with you. And then, yeah. so we were like, well, let's go back again. And so anyway, so now we've gone there every year and my twins are six and we've been there five times in six years. So they think we have a Maldives house, which is kind of cool, but also a little embarrassing. So anyway, that's, that leads uh, into my next at. question about that was, I was actually going to ask you to share a little bit with our listeners where your favorite place to travel is. And I know the oh, couple yeah. answers, but Let's say besides home, because I mean, your lake, sure. your lake home in Wisconsin over the summer is just pristine for you to go fishing and watch a sunrise or a sunset and sit with the kids around the sure. fire and golf and stuff. But what about, what about your, okay. uh, either yours or your family's? You could choose either one or both favorite place. To okay. Travel. I got, oh man, I got this. Um, okay. So I'll go international and I'll go local. Too. Got it. So internationally, obviously, we love the Maldives, but the trip we took with you when we went to Munich, Germany, um, was just an amazingly incredible time. We went there the week before Christmas. I think this would have been 2015, 2016. Uh, just an amazing trip. So going to Munich was so cool, but it's necessary, in my opinion, that you go home and you have an opportunity to 
reconnect with your friends, with your family, with your roots. And some people don't want to do that. There, some people are, you know, it's like a Jimmy Buffett song. <laughs> some people are running from the feds. Some people are running from the IRS. Uh, you know, some people are just uh, running from their past, but that, that's definitely not our case. Um, I've always found it incredibly important that when you go home, you try to reconnect and kind of recenter yourself. Um, when you live overseas, uh, it can be really, you, you kind of get lost in the hustle and bustle of everything. And it is really important to do that. And to me, that's never become more evident, um, the need to go home and reconnect than in obviously the era of, of COVID. And, uh, so when I go home in the summer and there's two places that I have to go every summer, because it just grounds, I feel grounded there. And, uh, I feel like I'm kind of centered back with who I am as a person. One of those places is a golf course I used to work at as a kid and college kid. It's a place called Ramsey golf club that actually it's closed and was bought by another course, but it's in my hometown, um, in uh, rural Minnesota. And I have to go at least once a year because it's the one place where I feel like okay, this is who I am. This is where I'm from. This is what I'm about. And it, um, it centers, it has a way of centering me that no other place on earth really has been able to. And so I always leave there happy. I leave kind of refilled, rejuvenated and knowing I've been able to come back to a special place. So for those of you who are expats, you might, that might, this might have to be a question we ask everybody. Like what is a place that helps you reconnect with who you are as a human being. I agree because we all have it. We all have that yeah. that point. You know? And when I go there, I prefer to go really early in the morning before the other golfers get there. I don't like to golf with other people when I'm there because this is a place that has so many memories for me that it allows me to just kind of reflect and um, yeah, just kind of become reacquainted with the person you used to be before you left. And the other one is kind of a silly one, but you've been here with me, and that's Wrigley Field in Chicago. That's home of the Chicago Cubs. You and I have seen uh, Jimmy Buffett concerts there. I take my kids there for baseball games. I've been there with friends lots of times. It's my favorite place on the planet. Uh, I just love to be there. It's, it's, I guess, my version of Disney World. It's the happiest place I've ever been. Um, so, yeah, I have to visit those two places every summer when I get home. And, uh, so that would be it. My favorite places to travel. So, well, those are great answers, man. I mean, you don't even that's have a, to think twice about story. those. <laughs> yeah, but it means a lot because it, what makes us who we are when we travel, we can't forget our identity when we travel and work overseas and we're proud yeah. to be Americans. We always joke about that. We say we are Americans, not Americans, <laughs> but you know, that is really who we are, you know, and we have to sure. have these memories that, that break, that we always <laughs> fall back on. Right. Yeah. I was just thinking about our pa our Panama Canal experience, and <laughs> that's it's another story time. Sorry about the it's story the, time, the man. <laughs> you want me to tell the Panama Canal story? Hey, it's your interview. I, I think the stories are what pepper no. pepper the entertainment of this this whole show, right? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So anybody who's never been to the Panama Canal. Uh, it doesn't sound amazing, but you have to check it out. It is so cool. First of all, Panama, the country is an amazing place. Panama City is a really cool city, but the Panama Canal is just mind-blowing when you get there, especially when you see the size of the ships going through and then you see them building the new one. Anyway, they bring you into the visitor center and you watch this movie about the Panama Canal and it goes into this description of how the French started and they couldn't do it because there was too many. Mus Basically, they made French. it sound like the French were like, what is this? There are too much mud and too many mosquitoes. We are going back to and disease too, and pestilence. And so they were like, well, the French couldn't do it. And then maybe the English or something came in and then they're like, and then the Americans came in and the Americans are, you know, the ones who helped get it built. And then they turned it over to Panama in what, 1990, I think? 1999, right? We're, we're right at the uh, yeah. turn of the century. Like I said, 1999. And so at the end of the movie, it was like, you know, Panama Canal, 100% Panamanian. And you and I stand up right at the end. You're like, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we didn't, that wasn't well received with the local populace. But I think we thank you. We the, might have had a. 
to our credit, we may have had a cerveza or two in our stomachs at that point. Yeah, I, I misspoke. Um, we didn't thank them. We we welcomed. We we congratulated. We said you're welcome to every Panamanian that we met. Like you're welcome. You can have it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was not well oh, received, gosh. but we had fun with it. We did. I don't. I don't know why Americans abroad can be perceived as obnoxious idiots, Greg. I don't know where this is coming from. So neither do I. I have no idea. Good people. Good, wholesome people. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, sorry for the side tangent there, but you know, don't be sorry time. at all. That's what makes this show so so exciting. It's your sense of humor and, and of course, the uh, stories that we have to share because we've gone through a lot of places and every everywhere yeah. is different. But like you said, though, going back to at home is it's where where we really feel and we bring that with us everywhere we travel and we don't forget. We wear our colors. We wear our pride. And uh, yeah. And we keep meeting other Americans overseas. And Americans overseas are very different than the traveling Americans, not the tourists. The American travelers yeah. are very different. Expats are different, well, you know, too. I, You know, I'm, I bet a lot of that can apply to just about any country, though, too. Absolutely. Yeah. What other questions you got? You got some good ones. I don't know, Matt. Uh, some other things to let your what? What else do you do besides uh, podcasting and teaching? You have a tell us a little bit about your sports background because you you mentioned the fact. I think didn't you say you were coaching um, like basket weaving or something like that back in Minnesota? <laughs> well, yeah. In my in all the coaching I've done at the high school level, I've coached you know uh, boys soccer, girls ice hockey, girls fast pitch softball. Uh, golf, uh, varsity soccer. Um, I've even been a roller hockey coach in Venezuela, which was kind of cool. Um, so I've got a quite a bit of a coaching background. I'm currently a athletic director at the school that I work at now. And so tied to that, oddly, and it's, you know, this is fortuitous timing because uh, I'm also working on transitioning my career from education uh, into the sports world too. So I'm actually enrolled at Ohio University. I'm a Bobcat right now. Are you really? And I'm working on I'm working uh, on what's called a PMSA. It's a professional master's in sports administration. And so uh, my goal, it's a lofty goal, but hey, if people don't laugh at your goals, your goals aren't big enough. Uh, I'm going to try and get a job with a front office of a professional sports team or work in the front office of a professional sports organization. And that's what I'm shooting for. I can't and wait so for I'm you to work for the par- Packers. I can't wait till you work for the Packers. It's going to be amazing. Um, yeah, that, yeah, I'll be the one Viking fan who gets a job working for the Packers, but I'll take it. I wouldn't turn it down. Uh, so I'm presently studying for that. So, uh, but also, you know, overseas gives you some opportunities to do some things you never think you'd get to do. So, for example, one of my huge highlights has been becoming a scuba diver. And I've had a chance to dive all over the Caribbean. I've dove with you all over the place, the, the Caribbean, uh, Florida Keys, Maldives, obviously, the Middle East, uh, things like that. So that's been really cool. That's taken me some places and on some really interesting adventures in itself. But um, Matt, so can I, I mention one thing to our listeners? You know, I've always asked sure. you, what's your favorite, what was your favorite dive ever? And of all the places that you've gone and the sharks i know you love seeing the big pelagic stuff and what's that one place that you dove that i didn't go with you that you keep thinking back on the place that i dove that you didn't well, go it's with more, it's more local for our listeners than anything else <laughs> Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, in in Atlanta. Yeah, you went into the Atlanta Aquarium and you had a better shark dive I, than you've ever had overseas I, anywhere around the I world. I tell you what. Yeah. Okay. Well, side tangent number three hundred thirty-seven of the day. I dove the Georgia Aquarium, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. I was there for an education conference for a week, and my boss gave me the afternoon off. And so I took off, went to the Georgia Aquarium, and I was I wanted to see if I could do a behind the scenes tour to go see like uh, just how the whole thing works. And then the lady said, well, hey, we have scuba trips. Are you a diver? And I was like, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. And she's like, well, you know, something, something. And I heard hammerheads. And before I know it, my credit card's out in front of her. And I'm paying <laughs> $375 to do a dive at the Georgia. The Georgia Aquarium, I think, is the largest indoor aquarium in the world. It's 40 feet deep and like, I don't know how many football fields big. So whatever. And I know there's people that don't like those sorts of things. But I'll tell you what. 
They had hammerheads, you know, you're ha- with hammerheads that are anywhere from 10 to 12 feet long, whale sharks. They had a 32-foot whale shark in there, a 32, a 28, a 20, and I think a 16. So they had four whale sharks. They had hammerheads. Uh, what else? Oh, uh, manta rays. And so <laughs> there, I was like, well, I don't have any equipment with. And she's like, well, do you have a swimsuit? And I was like, I got boxers. And she's like, well, you'll have a wetsuit, so you're good. I was like, okay, let's do it. And there you go. I was, uh, next thing I know, 30 minutes later, I'm sitting at the bottom of an aquarium with a hammerhead swimming at me with a manta ray doing loop-de-loops in my air bubbles. And the lights were going dim because a 30 foot long whale shark was swimming over my head. Uh, surreal experience. And so you can spend your $20,000 to go do all those trips separately, or you can just go to the Georgia aquarium. Spend three hundred seventy-five dollars and dive in your underwear. That's my favorite. One of my favorite dive stories ever. And we're going to have more dive stories on these episodes because we do a lot of diving around the world, and I I love that. You had to go yeah. back to Atlanta to have such a great dive trip. <laughs> yes, that's fantastic. You can turn that around on my episode too. But that's a great story to. about your favorite dive. I love it. Yeah, I plan to. But then also in the Middle East, you know, the weather's f- so fantastic most of the year with the exception of summer. So I also am able to play in softball leagues here. Um, we have a golf course right on our camp, not a country club. It's a sand course, but not many people get to play a sand golf course right on the ocean. Um, we live a block and a half from the Arabian Gulf. And so it's cool to have access to the beach. Uh, So my kids are continually, they're water kids now. They grow up, you know, looking at fish and sharks and stingrays. They love it. Um, What else? There's golf, there's softball, ice hockey. Well, they had ice hockey and then COVID. But anyway, now they play roller hockey until the ice hockey gets going again. Uh, And by the graces of the internet, um, you know, you get all the available sports packages. So you can still, if you're a sports fanatic like me, you can still check all that stuff out. But uh, yeah, those are some of my side interests. And I think I got maybe one year left before I'm looking at that transition back to the U.S. to hopefully work in pro sports. We'll Well, see what happens. No matter what you're doing though, Matt, in the future, we're going to be pumping out a bunch of (laughs) pumping. We're going to be creating a lot of podcasts and it's going to be a lot of fun. I think the, the listeners know who you are now. And that was the goal for this episode. So any last thoughts on uh, what listeners need to know about you, Matt? Uh, let's see. I, well, that's, that's a great question. Uh, no, I obviously don't take myself very seriously. So absolutely nobody ever thinks that I would. Um, I hope people have a good time listening to this and hope you enjoyed the story. And of course, if you have questions you want us to answer, once we get an email address, you can start sending those in too, but I appreciate you listening to the story and, uh, I look forward to more, more content. All right, listeners, that was my co-host uh, interview, the initial interview with Matt, oh wait, expat Matt, the family guy. And there we I'm, go. I'm Greg, the solo guy, uh, hosting this one, and we'll see you next episode when we turn the tables and Matt will interview me. So thank you for listening. We'll see you on episode three.